Good morning. About 54 degrees this morning, a little bit chilly. I'm wearing me a thin jacket. Put on my boots before I go to the barn. Try to keep the manure and smell out of the trailer. Change out into if we go in the house or the trailer and then put on these boots to go to the barn. Because I'm going to clean the Ida and Maddie's stalls. So, as they say, we'll wear the boots around the muck. The muck's getting deep. Hey girls, are y'all up? Are you awake? Did you sleep good, Ida? Hmm? You got a little mess in there? Hey, Maddie. Did you sleep? Hmm? You ready again? Okay, I'm gonna move you out of the pen. I'm gonna get in and clean the manure. I'm going to open this door on across the hall. And... Come. I think they like to go check out the next stall. <laughs> <coughs> Very willingly walk in. She's, she's laid down there. You can see a little bit of mess right here on her back in right there so you can see that she she has laid down to rest overnight i would like to see that know that they lay down and sleep get the wheelbarrow here park it right there let me see where here's that fork Frida has a fork here that picks up the manure and lets the bedding fall through. Put this in the wheelbarrow. do this at home even when I have them in, even in the barn at home every morning I go out there and I clean their stalls and feed them I do I do take care of all that before I have break my own breakfast I think it's important to take care of the animals before I take care of myself they work for me they're their life is totally entrusted to me. I'm sometimes humbled at, many times I'm humbled at, you know, they are so completely entrusted in me. Any mistake that I make on the road or wherever it be, their life is in my hands. They are so totally, completely given to me to do what I make them do and uh, I think it's a it's quite a responsibility that a person has to take care of your animals that they are they just completely trust their life in me to whether I feed them or don't feed them or bed them or water them or whatever I do. A little bit of fine chaff left over here from the hay and I'm going to spread that out in here and that'll be their bedding tonight. Now then, before I put her back in, 
and refill her water bucket. Again, the importance about caring for your animals, you know, make sure they have water and feed. Good place to stay. Looks like a little bit of light clouds around. I don't think there's any chance of rain today yet, but I think by tonight they're saying maybe a little bit of chance of rain. So we should have another nice day up at the cove today. Getting a little bit on the dry side. Really needs some rain, but the nice weather when we go into the cove is also very nice. All right, Maddie, are you ready to come back? You're still visiting the other pen. One of the things that the mules like, they, they like to sniff around and smell around where other horses or mules have been. They get attached to that. Come, I'm gonna go back in your pen. I got you all cleaned out and got your fresh water in there. i get that Ida's done and then I'll give you your grain and hay again. All right, you ready? Come. Yeah, you're ready. You want to go. You like to go visit the next pen, don't you? Easy. Yeah, come on. Step up a little bit. Step up a little bit. There you go. Whoa. All right, move the wheelbarrow down there. When I was growing up, of course, we didn't have tractor, and and uh, I was, you know, raised old order Mennonite, and so we did all the farming with uh, with horses. We did not have mules at that time. Dad, I guess he didn't know about mules or didn't know anything about them, but but had had horses. Had Dad had lots of horses, owned lots of horses himself, and then Dad would let people bring horses that we would train for other people break them and uh to mainly to work uh rarely to ride but mostly to work and we would work them in the fields and uh, that was also part of the source of of being able it was it was just like yeah breaking the horses was a was a job and we would get dad would get paid for breaking these horses but it was sort of like almost free labor other people would bring their horses and then we would work their horses on the farm to do our farm work and uh it was it was a good thing for dad he made a little money at it and then had these horses to uh to do the work but uh it, it is a job to to train horses uh, because you know you never know what you're going to get they can be very unruly but you know when you're a teenager and a uh, Y young like that that didn't bother me or brother Pete he was really really involved in that in uh, in breaking and training horses and 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 it really didn't bother us that bad at that time of course now that we're older we don't I don't enjoy it as much anymore as I did then but yeah we broke lots of horses for people and uh, it was a good thing and but I learned so much from that you know from from training all these horses what you do and what you don't do to make a horse and now then that I have mules from a very young age <coughs> it's it's very very important to train these horses and mules at a young age and to actually be able to conquer them break break their will or you know subdue them and i find it more and more what you do with a baby colt that's born 
on the farm, how you physically handle it. Just, just physically put your hands on it and handle it. It goes with them the rest of their life, just like these mules. You know, they were born there on my farm and within an hour or two, I had my hands on them and I was, you know, moving them around, picking them up. And these mules today, as big as they are, they still, they think I still can do that. And that, that's part of the secret to, to, uh, to make a, to conquering them to, so that they do what you want them to do is because at a young age, when they're a hundred pounds or less, that you can pick, that I can pick them up and make them do what I want to do, that they just never forget that. And that's the reason that these mules and my horses, that's, that's the reason that they, that they uh, obey and listen to me. But when we were training horses for other people, yeah, dad was quite choosy about that. He, he did not want to train any, any horses that were over three years old. So, uh, you know, when, once they get past three years old, it's very, very difficult to change a, a horse or a mule's mind. It, it, takes, it takes a major persuasion to, to, to get them to change their mind. All right, I'm going to take this manure out back and dump it. Yeah, as when we get out here, you can see there's quite a pile of it out here. I mean, I've, we've been here quite a bit this fall and I add to it all the time, but others that come, other friends that she has and she allows them to come here and uh, she ends up with quite a pile of this, but uh, there's some of her neighbors around here that come and, and, uh, and get it and use it in their garden. So you can see there, now you're talking about some good stuff to garden with. This manure mixed with the, with the hay and then shavings. This had to really grow, grow a good garden. Natural fertilizer. Yeah, yeah, I, I just I just love the respect that they have for me. Come, you want to go back? Come. You're not ready to go? Hmm? Come, let's go back in your pen. Whoa, you sort of got a dirty nose from eating those skimmings yesterday, don't you? Let me have to take a cloth and clean your nose and people pet you today. I have to a lot of times give them a face washing as pumice even those uh, skimmings even though I put them on the hay they still get them on their nose all right we're about starting to get a little bit of daylight now all right I'm going upstairs here to feed Ida and Maddie their hay of course they're they're both busy eating their grain right now so they're not interested in the hay right now. They, they like that, that grain much better than they do the hay. But drop it down in there. And you can see down through the slats there, you can see Maddie standing there. That's one of the things, you know, growing up like I did. And I guess Dad instilled that in us that first thing in the morning we get up before any breakfast. We go to the barn and take care of the animals, take care of the horses and whatever cattle and hogs, sheep that were in the barn. He never had many sheep, but he did a few times. But had, always had hogs and cattle and, and, of course, the horses. And we'd always, always had to feed them first. That was, that was always very important. So they're clean, watered, and uh, eating their breakfast. So now then we're going to go back to our trailer and. Sherry is fixing breakfast for us over there, and, and we'll after breakfast we'll come back out here, and I'll brush them and get their harness back on them, and get ready to go back to Cage Cove. Come in, we're having breakfast. Welcome. This is a coffee mug with me uh, grinding cane with one of my mules up at Cage Cove. Come on in. 
Yeah, so Sherry is uh, here fixing, fixing, yeah, fixing uh, some sausage breakfast. Now. And she's frying the sausage, already has fried the yeah, scrapple. Yeah, already done the scrapple. Yeah. So this is our little home away from home. Not very big. Our bed is up there, so it, the bed has to sort of multitask. Uh, <laughs> it's got everything on it right when now. When we're in bed, everything has to come down here. <laughs> and when we are down here, everything goes up there. And so a uh, refrigerator and a freezer here, and she's got the stove and a little microwave. And <laughs> behind us here is a, is a bathroom. If you want to open the door there and look in the, well, I should have turned on the light, but there's actually a through door here into the, into our storage compartment, but just a little shower and uh, if look around the corner here, just a, a little commode and a little sink and some cabinets. And it's very small, but it's home sweet home to us when we're away from home. It's uh, we, we have, we have brought some of the grandchildren with us. It's uh, it's very, very tight, but uh, it's okay for just her and I, but not not much extra room. But uh, it's uh, like I said, it's home sweet home to us when we're away from home, and and uh, she she's fixing breakfast. So I've been out in the barn doing the chores, taking care of the mules, and she's been in here fixing our breakfast. So we're we're fixing to uh, got me a cup of coffee here, and and uh, got a plate of scrapple here. And sorghum's right down there, but yeah. you watch your coffee. Yeah, so uh, yeah. I have, I, I'm a syrup connoisseur, so I have pickles, sorghum, barbecue sauce, honey, uh, some more barbecue sauce somebody gave us, but right here is number one, the sorghum jug. Some of this good sorghum that we made at home at Muddy Pond. I'm going to go ahead and take my hat off. I usually, when I go in the house, I usually take my hat off. I hope nobody minds my bald head, but that's just me. Uh, surprise, a lot of you didn't know that I was bald. Yeah, but I love that sorghum on scrapple. Look how thick, nice stuff coming out there. And, uh, you know, somebody said, don't you put quite a bit on it? And I said, it's my sorghum. It's paid for. I'm going to eat all I want. I love this stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, really good. So she's uh, working on the sausage right now, and as soon as she gets that, uh, that's also some sausage uh, from our hogs. Fr from our hogs, yep. And uh, that's actually not the link sausage; that was just loose sausage. And and uh, and she patted it out and made those sausage patties for breakfast. The link sausage that we made in the hog killing episode was that is generally a lunch or supper sausage that we eat, um, along with potatoes or anything else that you more, more of a heavy heavier meal and uh, basically about the same sausage but I don't know I guess that's just habit the way mom and dad did it and that's the way we still do it and right now she's frying that squat sausage and then in just a little bit she'll fry our eggs and we'll get started eating and what I what I eat is a, a scrambled or fried egg with this granola. This is your mom's recipe, correct? Yes. This is Emma Gunther's recipe for granola. It's on the back of some of our jugs. I think it's on the back of that. Yeah, I think jug. it's. Uh, let and me, it has let me sorghum in it, and I love it as cereal. I pour it in a bowl and put milk on it. Oh, it's no. Good. Th this one just yeah, right there, yeah, right th right there on the sorghum jug. If you buy anybody buys a jug of our the, sorghum. The corn. Uh, is it also on the pint? It's only on the quarts and half gallons because there was not enough room to put all that information on pints or anything smaller. So that granola recipe and the best sorghum cookies is only on the quarts, half gallons, best, and gallons. Best sorghum cookies is on the pints also. Oh, is it? Okay. Uh -huh. But the granola recipe is not so. on the pints. I can't remember. But anyway, it was, a, it was a recipe that mom made up. Read off what's in it if you want to. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so the the granola recipe calls for seven cups of oatmeal, one and a half cups sunflower seeds, one teaspoon salt, one cup brown sugar, and uh, let's see, one ha one and one half cup coconut, one cup wheat germ, one cup oil, and one cup muddy pond sorghum, and then it has all the instructions how to mix it together. And uh, and put, like it, toast it in the oven. put it put it like on a tray on a real thin layer of course metal this is plastic on a metal tray and um, and like toast it in the, in the oven and sherry is very fond of that I, I like it as well but it's a it's a very healthy uh, 
breakfast. And so that's what she's going to fix for herself, well, along with scrapple eggs, she, uh, scrambled eggs. She's not as or fond fried. of... I like fried eggs as long as they're done all the way through. Yeah. I'm just making sure the sausage gets done. <laughs> I'm real picky like that. I want to make sure all the meat, my meat gets done. He's different. He, he, he likes to eat his meat almost <laughs> not done, and then he wants his bread overdone. <laughs> Ain't that right? I do. I, I like my. I like any any bread that I have, toast or anything like that. I like it nice and ni nice and brown. Dark, real dark. He'll get yeah. the waffles at the at the Waffle House, and he'll say he'll say, "Make mine dark as you can make it." <laughs> and I'm thinking, "Oh my goodness, <clears throat> he wants it dark." But I always say, a good piece of meat is easily ruined by overcooking it. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but I don't feel that way, right? So I want to I want to say that uh, you know a lot of people say, well, I don't eat much breakfast. I, I don't. I I'm just not a big breakfast eater. Well, I am, and I'll tell you why. Um, I, I guess mainly because of the way I grew up by going to the barn, taking care of the animals, shoveling that manure, feeding them their hay and their grain. I feel like I've already worked. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sort of like my tractor. I've, I've not ran out of fuel. I, I need something to be refueled. So because of that, I'm a big breakfast eater. I, I, by the time I go to the house, I'm, you know, since supper, I haven't had anything to eat since supper, and I'm like a ravenous, hungry dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, right there. <laughs> oh man, that is funny. You know how how people get whenever they're really hungry and they sort of get almost mad <laughs> and feed him, and he's fine then. <laughs> it yeah. is, it is sort of like the animals, but I mean that's not really that funny, but it is kind of that way but i think i'm that way too you know how you get and you get a headache and you get and you're gonna eat i mean you hadn't eaten in a while and you're thinking boy and as soon as you eat you feel so much better he'll come in and he, he'll he'll not feel good and he'll say boy I, I just feel awful i don't know you know he's worked hard and then when he eats he says well that made me feel a lot better <laughs> so yeah eating helps everybody i reckon yeah <laughs> so she's sh sherry is very faithful about keeping me fed we, we eat three meals a day. It is a, at our house. It's a given breakfast is at seven o'clock. Unless that for some reason I can't be there on time, I will let her know in time before she starts cooking the meal. <laughs> Look at that and run out there. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, we agree, but automatically breakfast is at seven o'clock. Automatically breakfast, uh, lunch is at 12 o'clock. No, no question about it. I don't have to ask her. I'm going to do my darnest to be there on the minute. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try not to be late. And then again, supper is at six o'clock and I'm going to try my best to be there on time. I, I feel like it's, uh, like it's very, uh, important to be respectful to your wife or whoever is cooking for you. She's went to the effort to cook this food for me and it's hot warm it's ready to eat and then i'm not on time and my food is getting cold and the cook is getting hot it's it's a, it's a bad situation yeah it, it goes bad real real fast that way so so I'm, I'm pretty pretty strong on that to to be on time and and you know she she's she's went to all the out effort to, to, to cook that for me did you have your spoon yeah i guess i already got a spoon here okay. yeah. Yeah, so I try to be on time. It wor works out real good. But now there's nothing wrong with being late. But let's communicate about it. You know. Okay. Now your next. Stuff is ready. Do you want to start? Or should I? Oh, I guess I'll just keep on. Well, let me just. Let's just. I'll just wait till you're ready, and we'll eat together. See, well, I just have. I've got two more eyes, but I never. I, the stove's very small. I can't get to it, so I just use it, usually do it on one. Scrambling these things. I like fried eggs, but whenever I have fried eggs, I want them cooked done all the way through. I don't. I want the yellow done too. <laughs> and Mark likes the yellow not done. But scrambled eggs are good too. That ought to be enough for us. <laughs> That's a little bit too much, ain't it? <laughs> but it'll be good. Mark may have to eat some of the scrambled eggs too. Yeah. 
Okay, what else do you need? Why don't you go ahead and fix your, yeah, put that down and fix your granola. Because I'd, I'd like for us to eat together and, you know. And you're going to say a little prayer, right? Yep. Okay. I want to get my pink cup. Bowl of me. Ain't that funny? I got yellow ones for you. I got a pink one for me. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Anyway, the granola. I just love this stuff. And uh, it's, like I said, it's his mom's Emma's recipe. And I just put so much in a bowl and get me some milk. Got some milk here in the refrigerator and pour that on it. <laughs> and that and eggs is what I eat for breakfast. I think I just poured that, spilled that. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we're so thank thankful for the good night's rest that we've had this morning. The beautiful day that looks like again is ahead of us. Thank thee for this food. Blessed our body's health and strength. And be with us and care for us today. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay. So I've got my scrapple with sorghum on it. And I am a syrup connoisseur. So Sherry's barbecue sauce. That's what I like on my eggs. Just pour a little bit on that. Good. Very good barbecue sauce on I love it on fried eggs. And then, of course, I am a sorghum guy, but I'm also a beekeeper. <laughs> and so, therefore, I can justify using honey. Sherry likes sorghum in her coffee. I don't care for sorghum in my coffee, but I like honey in my coffee. A couple of tablespoons in that cup of coffee. And... Stir it up here and wish could tell you that you could buy these mugs but the Smoky Mountain Association who were who we were working with there at Cage Cove they they made these and sold them but well, they, had them made. they had them made in 2018 in 2018 but they're no longer available so um, can't can't get any more we, we, we bought two of them and wish we had a lot more but we don't they're not available anymore but Anyway. Hey, hand me my sorghum. Hand <laughs> I got you your sorghum. my coffee. Yep. <laughs> I don't drink coffee without it. <laughs> Sherry doesn't drink coffee without her sorghum. <laughs> I when, just pour some in there. When Sherry and I met, uh, of course, it was, it's was it been a long time That's ago. That's probably good right there. I guess I didn't drink much coffee at that time either. I didn't drink coffee. But she didn't drink coffee, period. Anyway, this place uh, right here in Maryville, Tennessee, uh, called Vienna Coffee, mm -hmm. started buying... Our sorghum. sorghum, and they asked if it was okay if they made a, a coffee and they called it a muddy pond mocha. They wanted to add that muddy pond to it, and we yes. said that's fine with us. It was fine with us, and so uh, the guy that owns the place came to Dollywood one time when we were up at Dollywood, and he handed me two tickets to get two of the muddy pond mochas. He said, "Try them out." I thought, "Boy, I won't be drinking that because I don't drink coffee anyway." She mocha that just sounded all. that didn't sound too good to me. But we go over there and, and, and get the two, and I took a taste of it, and I thought, oh, man, that is good. That hooked me right then. I go home, and I start making it myself. You know, it has some chocolate in it and different stuff. It's what mocha, that muddy pond mocha was. It's some kind of chocolate syrup or something. I made it like that for a while, and then I started just making it just with sorghum. And now I will not drink. I drink coffee every morning for breakfast, but I will not drink it without sorghum. I carry it with me. <laughs> we rode the mules down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I had me a little jug of sorghum with me to put in my coffee because I wasn't going to drink coffee without it. And uh, where all else do we go? Well, I took it on. We've been on several cruises and she always takes a jug of it along yeah. on the cruises. Yeah. Have to check it and um, uh, check it, you know, have to check a bag because to, the, it's eight ounces, but I have to, to the little 3.4 ounces, I think, just so I have some. <laughs> and, yeah. and so anyway, yeah, everywhere we go, I've, I've got it always everywhere. All right. Well, I'm ready to start eating here. We'll start out with a good scrapple. And those of you that saw us making that scrapple, it was like a mush. And now Sherry has... Let me show you what it looked like, too. Yeah. I brought it just in the bags that we froze it in. And I wrote on their scrapple. But And, it, and it's, it's a little bit... takes a little bit longer to cook than regular stuff because, see, it is sort of still mushy. This is thawed out. It was frozen. But I've got it thawed out now. And it is mushy. <laughs> and when and he wants it sort of crispy like that or sort of hard, you know, 
pretty it's, fried it's, pretty it's, good. It's brown on the outside, but still mushy on just the inside. A little bit, yeah. So it takes a little while to... And just absolutely delicious. Cook that. Yes. <laughs> that will stick to your ribs, and you can do a good half a day's work on that plate <laughs> with my fried eggs. And, and he, you know, they make scrapple, they make the liverwurst, and they make the cracklings. And I'll cook it for him, but I don't like none of it. I'm sorry. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that, you know, don't like stuff. I, I don't like the fatty... You know, the cracklings are sort of, of course, you know, some people puts it in cornbread and they're really good in cornbread, I guess. But I don't know. I just can't. The liverwurst, a lot of, you know, some liver in it. It's not my kind of thing. I'll stick with my that's, granola. That's the reason she eats scrambled <laughs> eggs and granola. I'll just stick with my granola. <laughs> but I have to say, she's very good to me. Even though she doesn't eat any of it, faithfully cooks me one or the other. Scrapple, liverwurst, or cracklings. Pretty much every morning. We well, also eat uh, the home the bacon that. They yeah, oh yeah, that's right, the bacon. It. Yes. Yeah, and it's really good. And yeah, I we, like we, it. we will have and to fry some of that and, and 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 tell about that. Oh, that is so good. So those four things: bacon, cracklings, liverwurst, and sausage. I guess everybody's thinking I am some kind of a smorgasbord pig. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> but 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 it is simply this way. I've been in that bed for eight hours or nine <laughs> with nothing to eat and I went to the barn and I mucked manure for a couple of hours and fed and all that and I'm hungry now I'm, I'm ready to eat and, you know I, I need to be like I'm like the tractor I need to be refueled or I'm like those mules I, I need my hand corn <laughs> That's good. If he ever got to where he didn't want something to eat, there's something wrong with him. <laughs> I know there's something wrong with him then. <laughs> Every now and then he'll come in the house. He said, "I just don't feel like eating much." I know he's not something. You know, he's not feeling good or something. <laughs> uh, so, somebody might ask, "Where did I grow up at?" Because I, I was I'm not originally from Muddy Pond, of course, but from Crossville, Cumberland County, Tennessee. It's about where my mom lives. Is um, about an almost about 55 minutes, almost an hour from where we live now at Muddy Pond. And it's in uh, Flynn's Cove area. But I grew up, um, we first lived um, in the Vandiver area. It's all in the Lantana area of Cumberland County. And my family, um, my dad and my brothers drove a truck, but he also had a little farm on the side. He always, he had, had a little dairy farm for a pretty good while. And um, I remember when I was little, I would bottle feed the calves. And I loved doing that. But um, I was always pretty young whenever he had the dairy. And then later on, he, he grew watermelon, cantaloupe. He was into a lot of this stuff, you know, not to sell, just for the family. Uh, I, we always had a big garden and uh, always made a garden. So we lived out in the country and I'm, I've always lived out in the country. And Mark was saying the other day, I said something about, you know, we like this old fashioned stuff and I like to dress old fashioned to do these, you know, all this stuff. And he said, he, he guess he, I was more old fashioned than he was. And I, I, I'm for the old fashioned stuff more than he is. And I, I really am in a way. Even though he grew up there doing all this old fashioned stuff, you know, he grew up, when he grew up, he was like Mennonite. So it was, um, it, it was a lot different than me because we did have TV <laughs> and we, um, and the one thing my family did, um, they played old time bluegrass music, the fiddle music, um, not, not the new, new bluegrass, but the old time, uh, good buck dancing clogging music. And I always have clogged. I just picked it up because my family played the music and, um. I'd be around places where, you know, they would go and play music and people would be dancing. So I'd go home and I'd get in front of a mirror and I taught myself to clog and really enjoy it. Love to do it. Love the music. It just feels like it's, when I hear the music, my feet go, go to tapping. It's just like it's inside me. It's, it's almost in my soul or something. <laughs> I love that old time music. And then when I met Mark, um, I guess I could go with that. Now, um, we were at, I was at the Museum of Appalachia with my family uh, that plays music, the Lantana Drifters. And um, I was dancing over there, you know, just under a shade tree. Mark was up there making the sorghum. <laughs> and um, that's how we met. He, he all of a sudden walked up and he asked me um, where some of the members of the Lantana Drifters was at. He was wondering, you know, because he, he, he had seen them over the years. And I told him, you know, I wasn't sure where one of them was at or anything. And we just got to talking. And uh, he wondered how long, how often, how how many years I had come to the Museum of Appalachia. Of course, I had come quite a few years with my family, and he had too, but we hadn't actually met. I think, 
I think he might have seen me dancing, but he did not know who I was. And so anyway, we just got to talking and he said, you want to get an ice cream? And here we go and get an ice cream. And it went from there. I mean, we got to talking to each other and that's how we met right there at the Museum of Appalachia with him making the sorghum and I was clogging, buck dancing. And, um, and of course my family's band there. And he, he loves the music. He said he always wished that his girls would learn to clog. And so he was just, uh, it, he just couldn't hardly believe that he met somebody that, that was into the old time music and somebody that clogged. Uh, he, you know, growing up Mennonite, you know, they don't really do any kind of dancing and, and not really listening to any kind of music much. But he said that when he came up there, he said he went back home after the first few times he went to the Museum of Appalachian. He told some of them that's the biggest guitar I've ever seen. The, it was fiddle, up, fiddle, fiddle. Oh, biggest fiddle he'd ever seen. It was upright bass. You know, they was playing this bass. And he said that's the biggest fiddle he had ever seen. <laughs> so I had been there at the museum for a bunch of years myself. And I knew the <clears throat> Lantana Drifter band, you know, I thought fairly well. I'd seen them a lot and absolutely loved the music that they made. But somehow I had always missed her. I had never seen her before and, and just happened to stumble on her that day. And uh, I'm very blessed to have found a wife that is 100% pulling as hard for my life as I am for my own. And she, she just sold out her life for our way of life. Just, I'm very blessed with that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm all into sorghum. I, I could not sit at the table or stand at the table and sell it if I didn't like it. I love it. And um, I, and then that barbecue sauce we started making, or I started, I'm, I was making it at home for ourselves, you know, just to eat. And we decided that might be a way to sell more sorghum because we got, we put 60% of it is uh, sorghum syrup in the barbecue sauce and decided to start making it. We go to a kitchen in Lebanon and um, me and him were the two that makes it. Nobody else, you know, we have a helper there that does some of the cleaning up, does some of the bottling, you know, just, we have to hire him. We just can't do it all ourselves. But anyway, we make every batch ourselves. And, and yeah, that just like his brother-in-law, uh, our brother-in-law said, you know, I dived in that sort of, it, it's just like, I'm almost more into it than he is. I don't do the part of, of uh, you know, I don't plant, I don't, I don't plant it. I don't do the harvesting, but I have always helped bottle it. I've always helped label it. I do the, I've got our website up. I do the advertising. We do a lot of advertising with these shows that we do because I hand out cards to people. We talk about where we're from and we have people all the time that come to Muddy Pond that have seen us somewhere at a festival where we've been. And um, it's just like, like he said, I was, I was a secretary. I worked in the office um, when I met him and I just quit all that, moved to Muddy Pond and dived in there and, and help him out everywhere I can. And, so both of my plates are empty now. <laughs> so I want to go back to that love story and <laughs> tell a little more details about that. So this was at the Museum of Appalachia, which is about 20, 20 miles north of Knoxville, Tennessee, where, where that I saw her, met her the first time. And uh, a year later, I decided that uh, it was had been long enough and I wanted to ask her to marry me. And uh, the museum is about 100 miles from where we live. And so I told her we wanted to go to Knoxville. So we went around a little bit, the round, long way around and went to Knoxville. And while in Knoxville, <coughs> and while in Knoxville, uh, I didn't want her to know where we were going or what I was about to do. And so I had her to get in the back seat and lay down so she couldn't see where I was going. I'm thinking, I'm going to get sick here in a minute. <laughs> and, and my son, Brian. And I didn't know what he was doing. My son, exactly. Brian, was helping me with it. And he, he was along with us. And and uh, he, he knew because I asked him to help me with it. And uh, so for the last 20 miles, she laid in the back seat and, and rode. And we got there to the museum and... He helped me, Brian helped me with it, and we put a blindfold on her, and I took her by the hand and led her back out there. Right I kind of had a little bit of suspicion what was happening, but I wasn't completely sure. We had already, he had let me pick out my ring anyway, so <laughs> we'd already somewhat done that. So I knew he was going to do it, but I didn't realize what he was actually going to do. <laughs> but I took her right right to the spot where, where, the first, where the first time I saw her and asked her to marry her, marry me, asked her to marry me. And yeah, that was uh, that was quite special. Yeah, and I guess what the next 
three months, four months later, we got married, something like that. Yeah, that's almost 22 years ago now. And uh, I think she's a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> Better be by now. <laughs> got my coffee thermos here. Sherry's put the coffee in there uh, that I'm going to take, and I'll take it along to the cove today and occasionally sip on a cup of coffee. And, of course, I like my honey in it and pouring that in there. And then I'll put the lid on it and shake the thermos. And, and uh, could you maybe wipe that off, please? Thank you. And uh, just an, an old Stanley thermos. I've had it for a long time. Cup is plastic anymore. It did have a metal cover over it. But one time I was leading the horses and had that thermos in my hand. And I don't know what happened, but I dropped it and it broke the lid off it. But that plastic top works just fine, so. It's got, great to have your own honey, your own sorghum, your own barbecue sauce, just yeah, about everything to put on. It's really great. Put, put yes. on all of our stuff, so we enjoy yeah. that, and we're yeah. gonna we're gonna eat it like some like somebody said that he might use too much of it, but we're gonna eat it. <laughs> it it's ours, and it's and it's paid for, and we're gonna eat it. But yeah, and we we work hard, but you know one of the, one of the, something else I'm gonna talk about a little bit is, you know. It's easy to say work hard and and life uh, and 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 you can get somewhere in life. You you can make uh, you, monetarily. You can gain, and you can. But you know, I often feel like there's more to it than just working hard. I mean, you can work hard and you can go out there and, and just beat on trees and tear out trees and tear out briars and and that's working hard. But you're not getting anywhere. And I think it's very important. Especially, you know, and I think that's where we learned it, all of us siblings, my brothers and sister, we all learned it from our parents. Not just work hard, but think about what we're working and what our goal is and 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 have a plan, whether it's in your mind or whether it's written in paper. And I was a very poor student in school. I, I had a real hard time. And I'm not very good with pen and paper or writing anything down, but I can, I have that in my mind. I mean, I have a whole list of things in my mind that I need to do every day. And, and it's, uh, and, and for the next year or for the next couple of years, may, maybe too many things on that list. But I think it's very important to have a list, to have, to have goals in your mind that this is, this and this and this is what I'm going to do, what I have on the list to do today and try your best to get all of that done that you can. Uh, and, and that goes along with work. work. But I, I, think it, I think it's important to have a plan. And, and also he says that he was poor in school, but he, he can do, he can build, make, come up in his mind he, with the, everything, anything and everything. He once said he can weld, you know, he can weld and he can build stuff with wood and um, concrete, he pour concrete, he can build a house, he can do whatever he wants to do. All this equipment, he's been behind most of it, you know, getting it put together, built, knowing where to get the stuff, knowing how to put it together. I don't know how he does it. It's just amazing to me. He's very intelligent, very, very good at building, making, and getting stuff things, done. Um, one, of the, one of the very important things that I think Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford vehicles uh said that I, that I that i think a lot about and then i've used a lot in my life that it is so important not that i'm always able to do everything that i know but to have friends and know of places and people that can do this stuff even if i can't do it know people that can do this and have those strong friendships and and uh and relationships with them and you know um, uh, the, these, these friends, give me that sorghum jar. The, these, these friends, uh, you know, when I go to them and I need something done and I take them and a the jug of sauce. sorghum or a jug, a jar of honey or a jar of barbecue sauce, uh, that goes a long way toward friendships and, and, uh, mm -hmm. not, not that I'm trying to bribe the, anybody, the bartering system, sorta. <laughs> but, 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 uh, I, I always keep a box of this stuff in my truck and, and I see somebody that 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 I know that's done some good work for them. Take them some of this stuff and say thank you. You know, I couldn't do it without you. And it it just takes you a long way in life. And oh, uh, yeah. all right. Had a wonderful breakfast here this morning. So I'm gonna put on my boots to go to the barn. 
I usually wear try to wear clean shoes. I have those house shoes that I always wear at home or whether we're on the road. And because, you know, I go to the barn and I muck manure and all that and my boots get smelly and try to keep that out of the house. So, you know, Sherry has less cleaning to do. And then, I, of course, I also drive with those shoes. And uh, so we're going to go to the barn now. Uh, first of all, i got to go back here and open the doors where I'm going to load the mules. I'll, I'll lead the mules out here and uh, load them in the back of the trailer here. Still got a little manure in there from yesterday and I'm going to stack up their wood. They play with the wood here sometimes. Unload some of it, unstack it. This is wood that we're going to use up at the cove to do the sorghum cooking with. This is a pretty good place to haul the wood with because the mules stand, stand in here and their heads are way up here. So there's sort of an empty space down here. So I've been doing that for years and a good place to haul the wood. Going up to the barn here. To, I'm going to brush the mules and, and put their collars on, put their harness on, bridles. They should be done eating. Get ready to go. Grind cane up at Cade's Cove. Well, Ida, it's almost time to go. How did you get your hay outside the outside of your door here? Hmm? Standing in the door and holding your head out looking for me, huh? Are you ready to go? Hmm? Let me brush you. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Brush them like that makes them look good. And there's something about brushing them, it smooths their hair or releases a pigment under their hair that, I don't know, it makes them feel good. They, they act like they like it. They like to be brushed. Okay, let me get the other side. Move over. Come. You already left me another pile, didn't you? Hmm? Uh, yeah, somebody has said, well, wh how much do these mules weigh? I've actually never weighed them. Their mothers, being Belgian mares, they, they, they're somewhere 1,900 to 2,000 pounds. But I estimate them to weigh somewhere 1,400 to 1,500 pounds. Yeah, pretty good sized mules. So that was Ida over there that I brushed first. And this is Maddie. And they, they act like they really like me to brush them. It makes them pretty, you know. I want them to look good when people see them. Well, we're going to be today at Cage Cove. But it also, uh, I think it feels good to them. It does something to their skin, their pigment. Releases something to brush them like that. Then right here, she's uh, obviously laid down overnight and got in a little bit of manure and sort of messed her hair up back here. So brush that out a little bit. Okay, we're done with that side. Let me get to the other. Uh, yeah, so we don't always have a have a nice stall like this to to keep them at where we uh, where where we and when we go do these demonstrations at Dollywood. There was a a neighboring pasture, uh, about a five acre pasture and a barn that they could go in that pasture, and I would just turn them loose. I, I would just turn them loose in that uh, pasture, and then they could go in the barn when and if they wanted to but for the most part they stayed out in the pasture um, there are some places that we go to fall, like fall creek falls they are just in an open corral pen and it's uh it's about the size of two of these stalls that that corral and they spend day and night in there in that but it's it's out in the great outdoors no roof over or anything 
And uh, like when we go to the Florida State Fair, they, uh, they actually have a pretty nice place there. They have a little barn and a barn barnyard, what I call a barnyard. It's a corralled in probably 100 by 100 area to where I can turn them out in that corral area and they run and play in there. And boy, do they. They, they have fun down there in Florida in that uh, uh, area. But there's also a barn where I put them in and feed them. And, uh, you, you, you have to have something. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't like to keep them outside in a, like just corral panels, but sometimes have to. Uh, I, like to I don't like to be in two rough elements, although I do like to go on river trips and, and sleep in a tent. But, you know, the mules like me, they, they, they like to have a, a place of, you know, of shelter. So, I'm going to put the collar on Ida first. And just open the collar up like that and put it over her shoulder. Yeah, you're first. You're thinking, yep, do I have to do this again? Nah, you like doing it, don't you? You like going to Cade's Cove, don't you? Okay, now move over so I can strap it. Move over. There you go. Whoa. And so the harness is uh, something, you know, somebody that's not used to harness would say, how can you keep that pile of straps from getting all tangled up? But again, something I learned at a young age in dad's barn. This is the breaching part right here. You put your arm under it and you put that, that the center of that breaching on your shoulder. The next piece is the back band. You put your arm under through that and sort of let that back band rest on your arm. Then this is the hames. And there's the other hames, and you take one hames in each hand, and you've pretty well got it straight. There's not much tangling up that can happen from that. And then I'll show you, I'll turn right here and go in here to Ida. We can leave the door open so that you y'all can see a little better. But she's positioning herself, getting ready. I'll, I'll lay the hames over first. That's the way Dad taught us. You, you lay the hames over first. And then you just sort of push the harness over it, and that breaching just sort of slides off my shoulder right onto her back. Look at that. So it, it's, it's up too far, but the first thing I have to do is put the hames on, on the collar. You can see this groove here on the collar. And you position the hames on each side, and I don't even have to look on the other side because I know what I'm feeling for. And then this strap here is called the hame strap. And so I put it through there, and you're not going to believe this, but I cinch that thing tight. Actually, I brace myself against her because it, I, I will move her sideways. I'm gonna pull on that so hard. It's important for those for that strap to be tight and those hames to fit in here. And that is the life of the collar for those hames to fit tight on that. Otherwise, it, if it's loose on there, those hames will wear. And then this is a very weak point of the collar. It just takes a few years, and a collar is wore out and ruined over it. So all that is secured. Back band is laying there. Now I'm gonna push the breaching back over her back end, pull her tail out over the top of it. Breaching is all in place. And then this is the back band here. And the belly strap is connected to the other side of the back band and bring it over here to this side and buckle it up. Now you don't want this excessively tight, just slightly snug. It sort of keeps the harness in place. And then these straps coming from the breaching to the back band, it sort of helps keep that breaching in line. And then of course, these are the traces. That's what's gonna get hooked to the single tree. And next, I'm gonna get the bridle, put her bridle on. And so this is the wrong bridle. Ida's head is quite a bit larger than Maddie's head. Just wait, I'm not quite ready. So I have separate bridles for them because I have, I have the buckles adjusted differently. You can notice uh, Ida has a really large head. I tell her she's got a big ugly head. To me, Maddie's head is a little bit smaller, just a little more petite and neat. And then of course that's the bit and she knows what's coming. Learned that at a very young age, even though she's just three years old. But by a year, even if I don't work them, I start putting the bridle on them and get them used to that bit. 
And then this is called the chin strap. It comes from the other side of the bridle. And just put that on there. You do, again, don't want it terribly tight because you don't want to choke off their breathing. But you want to be safe that no matter what they do, you don't ever want them to get that bridle off. Because if they ever get that bridle off, there's not much control on them. I mean, even though I can say, whoa, and maybe she'll stop, but if she's been spooked and doesn't have that bridle on, they can tear up Jack in a quick, so in, in, a, in a big hurry. Let's just say, for unknown reason, somebody shot a high power rifle, a humongous boom, and they had never heard it before. No matter how gentle that a mule or horse is, it can spook them because they were, uh, just like you or me, it, it would scare us. No, we probably wouldn't run away, but it, would, it, it could scare them to where they could do something foolish. And so because of that, as a horse or a mule keeper, it is your responsibility to make sure that everything is safe, that you do your best to make sure that they don't make a mistake. It is my responsibility to make sure that they don't make a mistake. And, uh, and even, though, even though, no matter how gentle a horse or a mule is, they can still do things that you don't expect. Okay, so she's all done. And I want to show you a little, diff little bit of difference on the collars. The collars are a little bit different. Except for that uh, uh, I, uh, Maddie's collar is open one hole further on each side because of her age, her shoulders have filled out a little bit more and she's just a little bit larger. And then again, as I said a minute ago, Maddie's head is a little more petite, a little more small than Ida's head. Ida has just a large mule head and then Maddie has more of a small head. So because of that, I am able to actually just push this collar over her head right onto her shoulders without having to open it. Now I can do it and I've done quite a bit of it with with Ida and as she gets a little older and her shoulders fill out a little bit more and get a little bit bigger um, the collar will be a little bigger and it'll go over her head a little easier because her head won't grow anymore but her shoulders will muscle out and fill out a little bit more and it, it will uh, make it just a little bit easier but and the reason that I like to push them over over their head is because when you open a collar on the top and you separate them like that, the hinge point is right down here. And again, it's sort of the weaker part of the collar. And the reason it is, it's all to do with breathing down here to allow them an airflow. And uh, by opening a collar, bending it like that, in just a few years, that leather will still uh, start cracking. Yes, I do oil these collars. Uh, Again, that's another point I want to make. The collars are leather. Both collars are leather, but these harness are not leather. They are nylon. That was something that goes back to my dad again. It was started back several years ago. It looks like leather, but it's actually heavy-duty nylon. And the wonderful thing about this, it's much more conducive to the elements like sunlight, uh, especially rain when a leather harness or any leather parts or whether it's your leather shoes get wet it's very hard on the leather and it doesn't take long it starts cracking and doesn't take long they have holes in them and the same with these harness uh, the leather harness when they get wet and parts of them bend uh, they crack and doesn't take long and they're broke stuff on it but I do, do want to say, uh, you know, I'm trying to preserve old ways. And that does bother me a little bit that I'm using nylon here instead of leather because the old ways would have definitely been leather. But I guess, you know, convenience sometimes just uh, overrules uh, keeping old ways alive. So anyway, got her strapped in there, push the breeching back in place, situate it, pull her tail over the outside of the strap, and buckle her in. Ready to go? Huh?
forgot I gotta put your rope on your bridle on you. But it isn't isn't it an amazing thing? These mules are so entrusted to me that they just patiently wait here. Whether I go to one mule or the other, they just patiently wait. They're not screaming, hollering, yelling. No back talk, just patiently waiting. I love to work with my mules. Good girls. Okay, door's open, I'll open the other door, and they'll both walk out. Come, Maddie. Come. Come. Come, Ada. Easy. 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 Well, good morning, everybody. We're uh, getting ready to head up to Cades Cove and make sorghum today with the old-fashioned way. I'm going to hitch up one of the mules to the cane mill and grind out, grind the juice out of our sorghum cane and then with an old-fashioned stove going to uh, cook, uh, cook it down and make some good old-fashioned sorghum syrup. I do want to make a note here as we're standing here in front of this barn. You see the sign. It says Pack Stables. This is a very good friend of ours that owns this barn. And she used to be in business to for people to come camp here with their RVs and and with their and bring their horses and ride in the mountains. But I have to say, Miss Frida is closed. Pack Stable is not open, so please don't call that phone number you're seeing on the barn and bother her with that because she is not open for business anymore. We get to stay here because we've been here for a long time and got to be good friends with her. Once again, it goes back to those important relationships to get to do things like this to help you through life. So come along with us and let's go to Cades Cove. Come. Move over, let me by. Come. Easy, easy, easy. You don't have to jump up here. Just step up nicely. You don't have to jump like that. those chains back here just for a little safety again just in case a door were to come open or they were to get loose just to make sure that they can't get out close the doors up and notice I've always got my shovel handle you never know when I might have a little compost okay they're closed in we're ready to almost ready to go I've got to do a few little things and then we'll be ready to go. Uh, it's a th the, the bed is 38 foot plus the neck. So yeah, it's ca what's called a 38 foot. Yeah, we, we bought this in, uh, in 2003. It was made by Cato Classic um, in Ocala, Florida. And uh, we had it built, uh, uh, designed that it had the, uh, all the structure was so that we could put in a black water tank and a gray water tank and fresh water tank and all the water heater and all that stuff and then we took it to a uh, company in northern indiana i think the name of it is on the other side here called showtime trailers and they put all the interior living part in it 
and, and then we had that done in 2004. Yeah, this company right here, Showtime Conversion Incorporated, they put all the living quarters in the front of it. And then, uh, of course, right here in the back. So we, uh, the bathroom comes back to about right here. And then that's home sweet home. And then we have this middle part here where we haul all the sorghum chairs, tubs of all our stuff, everything in here that we need to do the show. Except for the equipment, except for the cane mill and furnace. I have to make a pre-trip on that. And then, um, of course, in the very back, the back, uh, the door, this window right here, this is, uh, I've got it open there. It's like almost 60 degrees now. So I have to control that as we drive. I don't want the mules to be overly cold or overly warm in there so I control it. So this morning we're not gonna go a very high speed. So I have the windows open so they'll get a little fresh air. I can also, like in the summertime, open those windows all the way down. And then there's also some uh, vents. And, and just show you right here. Uh, the mules are right here in the back. Yeah. So we, we basically, so when we started doing this, we just used, we were using one of dad's old cattle trailers. And yeah, it was some... It was some pretty rough, uh, pretty rough staying and all that, you know, uh, it was basically closed, but, you know, it had some, some of the sides were open and, and, uh, it, it was hard to stay dry and definitely hard, uh, definitely hard to, uh, uh, for Sherry to cook breakfast. And so somebody said, well, what are these brackets here? And you see that's a half moon there in there. And so that bolt comes out and this swings out like that. And then I also have one on the front right here. And it swings out and the top part stays back. And when we get to the cove, you'll see the large pole on the cane mill. And, uh, and then, so when we travel around to these places, even like when we go to, uh, to the Florida State Fair, I, uh, I put that pole right here on the side. The, the, the bit large end comes right about here so that I can use the handle and the jack and the small end back to that end and then swing this out over the top of it and put the bolt in it and that just clamps it in there and it actually is up right about the same width it, it protrudes out just a little bit more than the wheels and the ladder but it was real funny uh, one of the first trips well two years ago the first trip we went uh to florida uh being this is somewhat considered uh recreational because we live in the front of it we don't have to go through truck stop scales but in florida they have uh, it's it's a different kind and I, I don't remember now what it's called but it's an, an an inspection and every every uh even pickups have to go through those inspection sites and they're inspecting for uh uh, you know, m might there be some foreign weed seed or something in the in the hay or uh, bugs or something being transferred. But anyway, the guy comes out and he looks at this rig and he looks at that pole and he says, "You all don't make cane syrup or sorghum syrup, do you?" I said, "Yes." He said, "My family does that right here in Florida." And he recognized that pole and he handed my paperwork back. Didn't even look at us. And I was a nervous wreck. It was the first time I'd ever done it. And, you know, I didn't know what to expect. And he was so nice and he was so thrilled what we were doing. And he just handed me my paperwork and he said, you guys are good. Oh, the other thing that they do inspect for, uh, you, um, in the United States, there's a thing called uh, Coggins. Uh, and, it, well, and, and we have to do a Coggins test. Even to go, even to leave our farm, legally, you have to have a Coggins test done on equine, mules, horses, donkey. There are some viruses, some diseases that are, um, you know, they, they, they can get out and, and, uh, uh, and get to other animals, to other equine animals. And so you have to test that your animals are clear and you have to show a clean bill, a bill of health on your mules. And uh, so I, yeah, even to come here, we did get that done. But to go to Florida, we have to have it done 30 days before we go. And it's, it's actually a, it's actually in a statement from your vet saying that you've had you've got that clean belt bill of health on your mules but but yeah that was uh back to the pole that was uh that was quite uh, impressive uh, 
the man there saw that pole and he knew exactly what we were doing but but that's how we move the pole around i mean i have multiple quite a few poles but i have one favorite pole that i'm the one i'm using at cage cove it's sort of got some unique character and crooks to it that i like and and i take it along with me and pretty protective of that pole yeah so anyway we're just about ready to go now and uh i'm gonna take my rubber boots back off and i've got them here on this side i'll be right back let me get them up here on this side So again, I don't like to get in get in the vehicle and be smelling horse dookie. So I take my rubber boots off and I put on my clean little slippers. Just some leather slippers that I keep. I wear them a lot in the house and when I drive just to keep the manure smell away and all that, you know. And then I just put my boots on the back and as soon as we get to the cove, I will change again. Yep. Jerry just reminded me I have to go back to the trailer on the other side and put the step up. We've got the truck started, warming up, almost ready to go. Jerry's getting in. Sort of a different step. Actually, when we got the, the trailer, it did not have any steps and it was such a high step from the ground to go up up into here and yeah they made some steps but then they folded underneath it and they were even lower and especially like going to to, uh, to the cove some of those some of those knobs they're so sharp that i have to be very careful where i drive so that i don't drag the bottom so i came up with a little design i made those little hinges and bolted them up under the frame and fold this thing up and then just an old farm linchpin go through there and hold the step up i enjoy going to the barn and getting the mules ready and working them but i also enjoy getting in my truck and nice truck we we bought this truck new back in uh in august it's a ram 3500 with a cummins engine on it 450 horse very nice truck does does a good job pulling that big trailer the trailer empty is about 10,000 pounds Another 3,000 pounds on the mules and then the sorghum that we have in there, probably a couple of ton on, on, on that. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty heavy trailer. Yeah. But, and, and another thing I want, I want to point out, I actually choose to have a single wheels. Um, a little more rubber on the road would be good, but uh, the single wheel there, even, it's, it's the same 3,500 suspension under it that a dually would have. And, and a dually to pull this trailer would be really great, but a dually to just go out on the road traveling is just so cumbersome, it's just so wide, so much more rubber rolling, hard to find a parking spot, and um, it's the second one that I've had. The, the other truck that I have was a 2006 that I bought, that we bought brand new, and uh, we've got almost 400,000 miles on it, and it's, it's the same way. It, it has that 3,500 suspension under it, and then of course i buy um of course we just bought this truck so it has firestone tires on it i'm not going to knock the firestone tires but i prefer michelin tires they are they are really good good uh, durable long lasting tires i can get about 60,000 miles out on this truck like that and then i get the heaviest thickest wall that they make because i am maxed out as far as carrying weight, what's really legal to be uh, carrying on that on just two wheels instead of so you can see the front of that trailer it has the it has the truck squatted pretty good. So. Yeah, so we're ready, ready to go. We'll roll the window down here. Come along. So you all come along and come see us at Cage Cove.